Okay, well, thank you very much, Josie. When, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I uh, was invited originally a few months ago. Josie asked me to give a different perspective. So, and he asked me to speak in an optogenetics session. So this is optogenetics without the genetics. Um, and what I mean by that is we're using a, an alternative or maybe complementary approach to, uh, to impart light sensitivity on a blind retina. Um, so we've heard about optogenetics, where you take a gene encoding an opsin and you express it exogenously in a neuron, a retinal neuron, and uh, that, and that opsin finds an endogenous uh, chromophore, 11 cis retinal, uh, and uh, we call it a photo switch, and the combination of this gives you light-sensitive channels. Uh, we're doing sort of the opposite, which is taking advantage of uh, endogenous channels and building synthetic photoisomerizable compounds that act as photo switches. They act on these uh, voltage-gated ion channels to impart light sensitivity on the intrinsic membrane properties of neurons. And so, um, so we've been doing this for several years. Uh, we've done it with a variety of different kind of compounds, as you'll see. But the basic idea is that, is that these compounds uh, contain a, a several chemical constituents, including the most important part, which is the central part of photoisomeral, um, photoisomerizable azobenzene. Uh, they contain a, a, a tetraethyl ammonium or quaternary ammonium, which acts as a blocker of many kinds of voltage-gated ion channels. And then they contain a variable uh, group at the end, which is sort of sticky. And so, so these molecules somehow find themselves inside of cells. I'll talk about that more a little later. They embed themselves in voltage-gated ion channels where they block conduction of cations. And then if you photoisomerize the molecule from trans to cis, you alleviate that blockade of the channel, and now ions can flow. And as I said, we've made a variety of these over the years that have different preference for different types of voltage-gated ion channels. We started out with a molecule that required UV light in order to photoisomerize, AAQ, and it worked primarily on potassium channels. But over the years, in collaboration with Dirk Trauner, uh, Mer uh, Matt Banghart, who was in his lab at the time, um, we made a, a, a variety of, of derivatives of AAQ that uh, prefer different kinds of voltage-gated channels, and in addition, are, re are redshifted in their absorbance, uh, allowing them to work in right in the middle of the visible spectrum. Uh, and also, these molecules photoisomerize and relax quickly back to their ground state, so they can just temporarily be, be switched back and forth. And within milliseconds, they can block and unblock channels with just a single wavelength of light. And so if you apply these molecules onto a blind retina from an RD1 mouse, uh, this is a multi-electrode array recording from, from a mouse retina. Uh, if you take a retina out of, out of this mouse, the mouse goes blind within about a month or so. It loses uh, virtually all of its rods and cones. Uh, and so when you record from these ganglion cells, you see lots of spontaneous activity, but as you flash the light on and off, there's almost no response to light. This is a, a sum of all the activity from these 60 or so uh, neurons that we're recording from. If you treat this uh, retina with uh, one of our compounds, and the one that we've been using most is called DNAC, one of these uh, red-shifted uh, compounds, uh, if you treat just for a half an hour or so with a compound and then wash it away, what you find is that you stably make these neurons sensitive to light. So now when you turn on light, you get a brisk uh, series of action potentials. When you turn the light off, the action potentials cease, and you can go back and forth with multiple cycles of light and dark and uh, get this activity. You'll see that the that the spiking uh, uh, accommodates over time, and that's primarily due to, not due to uh, uh, properties of the photoswitch relaxing, but rather uh, voltage-gated ion channels in this cell uh, uh, 
contribute to this, uh, to this sort of adaptation. A cell can only spike at such a high frequency for a short period of time before the ion channels themselves slow down the spiking rate. Um, so, so we can indeed restore light sensitivity from this retina. One thing that you'll notice is that uh, the ganglion cells are all responding with the same polarity to light. We'll get back to that uh, in, in a moment. Um, if we were sort of concerned that perhaps we're making the entire retina epileptic by uh, having it uh, fire in response to light, but when you shine just a small spot of light at just a, a region recorded from by one electrode in this array, you only get spiking in those uh, in, in neurons that are next to that, uh, that are picked up by that one electrode. So we know that we can get spatially constrained, spatially precise light responses from these neurons. Um, so uh, in addition to electrophysiology, you can restore behavior. We haven't gone so far with the behavior. We've just done a few sort of simple demonstrations that you can restore behavior. This is uh, the pupillary light reflex uh, in a mouse that has no rods or cones or melanopsin expressing retinal ganglion cells. And it's the same mouse eye before and after injecting one of our photoswitch compounds. And you can see that the pupil is very large and sort of fixed and dilated in before you inject the compound. And after you inject the compound, there's some, uh, there's some basal constriction of the, of the pupil. But on top of that, you can see that it responds to light with further constriction as the light goes on you'll see that there's pupillary constriction. And that happens repeatedly as you turn lights on and off. So the pupillary light reflex is uh, triggered by brain circuitry. So we've restored at least this one sort of simple kind of behavioral response to light. We've done a couple of other things behaviorally to show that uh, we can get signaling through brain circuits. This is a uh, light. Uh, uh, light elicited uh, fear conditioning where we pair a flash of light with a shock and uh, initially you do that just three times on one day and then uh, 24 hours la later you test the mouse to just the flash of light alone. Uh, a wild type mouse will very quickly catch on that light is a, something to be feared and uh, as you turn on the light it freezes and it stops moving around. Uh, already one mouse that, uh, that has no rods and cones, it never saw the light on day one, and it doesn't respond to light on day two, so it just kind of uh, merrily goes along its business as if it didn't see anything, because it didn't see anything, it's, it's blind. But if we take an RD mouse and we inject it with DNAC shortly before we do the conditioning on day one, we discover that we can restore this, uh, this fear conditioned light aversion on day two. So the mouse you know, does have this sort of behavioral restoration of, of light sensitivity. Um, so, so at least to that extent, we know that we can restore uh, the, the electrophysiological and at least some behavioral uh, responses to light. Uh, and this is not something that is specific just to mice. We've seen this in blind, other uh, mouse, uh, other, not, other animal models of, of retinal degeneration. Uh, this is experiments we've done in collaboration with William, William Beltran at University of Pennsylvania uh, with a strain of blind dogs that essentially has retinitis pigmentosa. Um, before uh, applying DNAC onto this retina, there were some residual cones, presumably. So there's a very small, very fast sort of residual light response each time you turn on the light. But after applying DNAC, you restore this sort of massive uh, light response. Um, in fact, we probably overdid it here, and the response lingers on for much longer than we see uh, usually. So, so in very, and, and we've done experiments now also with rats and blind rabbits as well. So across a variety of species, we can restore light sensitivity with something that is essentially just a drug candidate. Uh, this is all without any 
genetic manipulation of the of the retina and so you know the big i guess how many millions of dollars should we ask for twenty million dollar question is 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 the not going to be suitable for for human use of course we don't know this yet but as part of a collaboration with several other investigators including russ van gelder university of washington we're very seriously focusing in on this question. And um, so in, in many ways, DNAC has properties that would be sort of compatible, I think, with, with human use. Uh, it responds to visible wavelengths of light in the safe part of the spectrum. Uh, it responds to light of an acceptable intensity. It's bright light, 10 to the 14th photons per centimeter square per second is photopic light, typical of daylight. Uh, but it is uh, acceptable, it's not damaging uh, as far as we know. Um, after you inject DNAC into the eye, it remains photosensitive for two or three days, um, uh, but we're gonna get to an alternative in a, in a moment. Uh, so far, it seems to be non-toxic, according to several uh, uh, measurements, counting cell nuclei, doing tunnel assays, over, uh, over a single day or over a week, we don't see signs of retinal toxicity. Um, and as I said, it can drive visual behavior in vivo. We'd like to do a lot more in the way of behavioral assays. Um, and, but there's even better ahead. I mean, there's many ways. Uh, there's a whole uh, possibility of changing the chemical structure of DNAC, and we now have a better uh, a derivative of DNAC called BNAC, which is about 20-fold more potent, it works at 20-fold lower concentration, so in the low micromolar range. And after injecting it, instead of persisting just for a couple of days, it persists for many days. We still see light sensitivity uh, 21 days after injection. And in rabbit, pharmacokinetics data suggests that the molecule can persist for over 30 days. So, uh, uh, so we're now doing more of the other kinds of tests with BNAC to make sure that it is safe. We think, if anything, it'll be safer because it's even more potent. Um, so along the way, we discovered something uh, that was a great surprise and at first a great mystery about the way that these compounds work. Um, so, I mean, one of the major questions is understanding which cell type in the retina is the main target for DNAC, BNAC, and the other photoswitches. And uh, so one simple way to, uh, to, to ask this question is by blocking synapses in the retina with pharmacological agents. And the most extreme way to do this is to put on a cocktail of, of antagonists of all the neurotransmitter receptors in the retina. And so here's an experiment where you put on blockers of glutamate, GABA, glycine receptors, as well as nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And the question is, will the ganglion cells by themselves be able to respond to light once they're cut off from their synaptic inputs? And the answer with all of these photoswitches is yes. We see that even after blocking synapses, light will elicit, if anything, an even stronger light response from the retinal ganglion cell meaning that the ganglion cells themselves are a target for DNAC action. So this was all fine, but then we decided to just try as a control experiment to see what would happen in a wild-type retina. Ordinarily, in a wild-type retina, the rods and cones are the contributing to the retinal ganglion cell response, and it's difficult to dissect out the contribution that's coming from rod and cone signaling that from that what would be coming from uh, photoswitch acting on the ganglion cells. But using these antagonists, we don't have that problem anymore. Now we're looking just at the ganglion cells. And to our great surprise, when we looked at wild-type retina, we noticed that there is essentially no light response from wild-type retina. And you know, at first we thought maybe there's just an access problem. For some reason, our compound isn't making it uh, into the retina or across the limiting membranes of the retina. Uh, if uh, if it's wild, if it's wild type, maybe it's just excluding these compounds. So we did the same experiment on retinal slices, 
and on retinas where we put little slits in the retina, and under no conditions could we get photosensitivity from the retinal ganglion cells. So there seems to be some, something happening to the retinal ganglion cells that's making them sensitive to our compounds that's a consequence of retinal degeneration. And once again, this is true not only of mouse, but of dog retina as well. So we think it's probably going to be a true across species, including perhaps in man. There's something that is degeneration specific about, about this whole process. And so the question is, what is the mechanism of this degeneration specific photosensitization? Um, and I'm going to tell you about the mechanism, but there is a point to all this. It actually has, you know, it's actually quite a favorable thing to have a drug candidate that is active when there's a disease, but essentially inactive when there's no disease. So we considered a variety of possibilities. Um, when the rods and cones degenerate, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so what is the mechanism uh, of this, de this degeneration-specific photosensitization? There's really two parts to that question. The first is, uh, let's start with number two. Something is changing in the ganglion cells to make them sensitive to DNAC once the rods and cones die. But there must be something also about the rods and cones dying that's communicating to the retinal ganglion cells. So there's really sort of two parts to this larger question. And we're going to address first what changes in the retinal ganglion cells. Um, so I'll give you the answer. What's changing in the retinal ganglion cell is that they're becoming more permeant to compounds like our photoswitches. So one thing that these photoswitches all have in common is they all have a positive charge on this quaternary ammonium, which should make these molecules impermeant uh, across, across uh, lipid bilayers. Uh, but these molecules we know are getting inside, at least in degenerated retina. And I'm going to show you that the reason they're getting inside is because there are pores that are opening up in the plasma membrane of retinal ganglion cells that are big enough to allow big organic cations like DNAC and, and BNAC to get inside. And there's several candidate uh, pores that could play this function. There are TRPV1 channels. This is also known as the capsaicin receptor. We don't see very, very many of these in the retina, so that's not a likely candidate. But there are a lot of P2X receptors. These are ionotropic receptors for ATP. Also, they can form big pores. And I'm going to show you that they are what is responsible, that they are changing in, in degeneration. And they allow things like our photoswitch to get in. So the way we tested this is by carrying out an experiment like this. Uh, when we treat with photoswitch, we apply it for 20 to 30 minutes or so. We wash it away. And then at some later time, we test whether the retina is photosensitive. And so in these experiments, we simply block the P2X receptors during the loading part of this procedure. And what we found is that blockers that are uh, P2X receptor blockers that are either uh, broad acting or specific for P2X7 both prevent these photoswitch compounds from causing photosensitization of these RD1 retinas, whereas the capsaicin receptor uh, inhibitor has no, has no effect. Um, if we switch around the experiment and add the blocker during the test of photosensitivity, we see that the retina has already become photo switch, uh, photosensitive because the, the compounds have already gotten in this cell, and P2X receptors are playing no part in the light response itself of these ganglion cells. Um, so this is actually a paper that is currently under review. And there's other evidence that P2X receptors are involved as well, but I won't go through all of it. Um, uh, well, I guess I'll mention this as well. Another, evident, another piece of evidence that it is that these cells are really becoming more permeant is that it's not only just photoswitches, it's uh, fluorescent dyes also accumulate in these uh, ganglion cells from RD1 retina, whereas they don't accumulate in cells from wild-type retina. And it's really quite a stark difference in the way that they're accumulating these dyes, and we can prevent that accumulation by treating with the P2X receptor inhibitor while we're putting on the fluorescent dye. So 
It turns out that it's not, you can see here, there are some ganglion cells that are picking up this dye, but it's not all of them by any means. It's only a fraction of retinal ganglion cells. So we asked which fraction is it? Um, and uh, I think I'll skip this slide because I have too much anyway. So of course we know, coarsely speaking, that the retina has retinal ganglion cells, some of which turn on to a spot of light in the center of their receptive field, and some of, the, some of which turn off to a spot of light in the center of their receptive field. Um, and of course, in a blind RD1 retina, we can't tell from an electrophysiological recording whether a neuron is an on cell or an off cell, but you can tell by looking at the morphology of the cell. So on ganglion cells send their dendrites to the sublamina of the interplexiform layer where they contact the terminals of on bipolar cells, and off ganglion cells send their dendrites to the off sublamina of the, of the IPL. And so we took advantage of the, this morphological uh, difference by looking at, uh, looking at a retina where, uh, that is expressing yellow fluorescent protein uh, under the control of the Thi1 promoter. So you see this scattering of uh, sparsely labeled uh, retinal ganglion cells throughout the retina. And if you zoom in, you could see one of these ganglion cells. And if you look at this with a spinning disc confocal microscope, you can tell what layer the dendrites of that ganglion cell happen to reside in. So here's a cell that, whose dendrites are in the on layer, here's a cell whose dendrites are in the off layer. And it turns out from doing uh, many recordings from cells where we've morphologically mapped their dendrites, uh, we could show that it's only the presumptive off retinal ganglion cells that are actually counterintuitively responding to DNAC and therefore responding to light. And the difference is quite uh, dramatic. Uh, on and off cells never respond. The cells that are bistratified never respond. It's always uh, the off cells that are responding and the on cells that are not. Um, so in addition to electrophysiology, you can see the same difference when you look at this loading of fluorescent dyes. This is a different fluorescent dye called Yopro, which is known to permeate three, through P2X receptors. It binds to DNA, so it labels nuclei. And so you can see, if you look at on versus off ganglion cells, that the off ganglion cells have nuclei stained with this dye, and the on cells do not, and uh, the, off, uh, the on off cells also do not. So um, it really seems to be that molecules that are larger than a certain size, char, uh, cat, large organic cations, can get into these retinal ganglion cells, the off retinal ganglion cells, through P2X receptors. So the other part of the question I was asking is, all right, so if we know what's changing in the ganglion cells, what is changing, what is the signal that comes from rods and cones degenerating that's picked up by the ganglion cells that leads to the, the change? And there are several possibilities you could think of. One is, you know, perhaps the ordinary light-driven synaptic signaling in the circuitry of the retina uh, is no longer happening in a blind retina, and that loss of signal is what's causing uh, the change in the, in the off-retinal ganglion cells. We don't think that this is true because we have other models of blindness, including the triple knockout uh, mouse, which is lacking genes required for phototransduction, but morphologically doesn't show degeneration of rods and cones. And we find that DNAC and BNAC have no effect on those retinas. So we don't think that this possibility is the case. Another possibility is perhaps when rods and cones die, there's loss of some trophic factor that influences the ganglion cells. And in the absence of that trophic factor, the ganglion cells change. We haven't really tested this possibility, but there are some obvious candidate trophic factors that might have an influence on ganglion cells. There's a third possibility, though, that it's, it's neither the synaptic signaling nor the rods and cones themselves, but rather some factor that is actually gained uh, that the ganglion cells normally aren't exposed to, but during de degeneration they become exposed to. 
there's a whole lot of retinoids that are produced either directly or indirectly by retinal pigment epithelium, one of which is all trans retinoic acid, uh, which um, uh, Robert Mark has shown uh, plays a role in remodeling of the outer retina. And so perhaps this acts as a signal sensed by the retinal ganglion cell. And so we have evidence that if you use a photo switch, uh, this is a different photo switch for sort of technical reasons, uh, some of the stuff I skipped. If you put this photo switch on a, on a RD1 retina, it induces photosensitivity. If you put it on a wild type retina, it doesn't do anything. But if you inject this mouse eye with retinoic acid several days prior to doing the experiment, now you can recapitulate the effects of degeneration, and that photo switch will start to act on retinal ganglion cells. So retino retinoic acid is kind of uh, mimicking what happens during degeneration. We've also been able to actually measure, through experiments I don't have time to tell you about, uh, the presence of retinoic acid signaling in these ganglion cells in, in the, the occurring in RD1, but not a uh, wild type retina. And uh, also, you can see after treating with the retinoic acid, just as in RD1, you see accumulation of fluorescent dyes in those cells. So, and both of these effects are eliminated by blocking P2X receptors. So now we can put together this whole pathway of what's happening. Uh, photosens why is photosensitization specific to one kind of retinal ganglion? Oh, I'm sorry, why is it happening only in degenerating retina? In degenerating retina, the ganglion cells are exposed to retinoic acid that's kind of leaking through the retina. Exactly how that's occurring, we don't know, but presumably it's, it's turning on gene expression. We are able to measure upregulation of P2X receptor genes and also the gene encoding HCN channels, which is the primary ion channel target of, of DNAC and BNAC in retinal ganglion cells. And so sort of accidentally, we stumbled across this whole pathway of action that is selectively making the diseased retina sensitive to these photoswitch compounds. So I mentioned that there's a benefit, perhaps, to having light sensitivity occurring only when there's disease. Uh, and one of the benefits of that may be that uh, not only across retinas, but even within a retina. If you take the example of of macular, age-related macular degeneration, uh, you have degeneration occurring in a, sort of a minuscule part of the retina, the macula, which constitutes maybe 2% uh, or so of the entire surface area of the retina. That's where degeneration is occurring. So if you wanted to inject a drug, or even a gene for that matter, that was acting uh, to install light sensitivity, you would, you know, it, it might be preferable to have that light sensitivity acting in that one spot and not introduced everywhere. And so in collaboration with Dan Plonker, who's sitting over there, hi, uh, we've been addressing this uh, in mice. Of course, mice are not a really exact model for macular degeneration since they don't have a macula, but we are able to induce local degeneration in an experimental way. And uh, one way to do this is by putting something underneath the retina. Uh, in this case, it's, it's Dan's very fancy implant that uh, is put uh, subretinally and implanted in, in rats, actually. Um, and then uh, a, a month or two later, if you examine the retinas, uh, the implant is able to uh, confer uh, uh, electrical activity onto the remaining layers of the retina. But one of the consequences of, of implying, applying these subretinal implants is that they sort of squash and actually eliminate the photoreceptors that are immediately beneath it. And so you can see uh, the photoreceptor layer sort of coming to an abrupt end right where this, this, uh, this silicon wafer has been implanted in the eye. Um, and so using this kind of method, we're able to get local loss of rods and cones. And so if we take a retina out of a rat that's had one of these implants uh, and we examine it, you can see local regions where 
this dye, Yopro, which normally doesn't enter into retinal ganglion cells, is able to get in. And you could probably guess that that's where the implant was. And if we quantify the fraction of cells that have accumulated this fluorescent dye underneath that, that chip versus in a control region, the, it, the number of cells are, are clearly uh, picking up this dye, are much higher there. We're in the middle of doing experiments to see if photo switches also selectively impart light sensitivity only in this region and not in other regions of the retina. We're still in the middle of those experiments as we speak. So just to sort of summarize, uh, our tools for imparting light sensitivity have evolved over the years. Uh, we started with channels that required UV light in order to photo switch. Uh, we've moved up to to channel to, to photo switches that use white light that are more and more sensitive, and finally, uh, finally that may be appropriate eventually for for human use. And I would say, you know, our biggest uh, our our biggest remaining hurdle to really human use at this point is sort of fully understanding and evaluating the drug delivery, how you get these molecules to disperse uh, appropriately in the eye, uh, and, um, and any advice we could use about this kind of, about drug delivery processes uh, that will extend the delivery time would be very useful. And so with that, I want to acknowledge uh, the people that have been involved in this work. Uh, People over the years working in my lab, too numerous to mention, but they've uh, obviously been fantastic. Uh, collaborators, starting with Dirk Trauner, uh, whose lab initially made these photo switches, um, through many other, uh, many other people uh, at Berkeley and at other institutions. And of course, uh, this work was supported by grants from the National Eye Institute and, uh, and other organizations. And I'm supposed to disclose that I have a financial interest in a very minuscule company that is uh, interested in commercializing this technology. So thank you.